Hello students, welcome to the lecture on discounting and rediscounting of export bills and after this lecture we will be able to learn the following objectives. Understand the role of International Chamber of Commerce in times of turbulences. Explain methods of payment in international trade. Define concept of export finance. Discuss stages in export finance. Describe a quick guide to an overseas investment insurance policy. Define rediscounting of export bills abroad scheme EBR. Let's start with a brief introduction to discounting and rediscounting of export bills. After shipment of goods, the exporter may submit the export bill to its bank for, redis for discounting purchase. This bill discounting facility may be a sub-limit to packing credit or may be a separate limit depends on the bank's sanctioning authority. In bill discounting, banks buy the export bills, that is, bill of exchange promissory note before it becomes due for payment. The transaction is pr practically an advance against the security of the bill and the discount represents the interest on the advance from the date of purchase of the bill till it is due for payment. Normally, the export order which is already getting credit under packing credit limit will not be covered under bills discounting. Also, if the client requests for bill discounting, the amount will be adjusted first against the packing credit limit outsiding against said bill and the balance amount is re released to the, to the client. In one sense, it looks to be an unsecured limit as few banks gives bill discounting facility over and the regular limits sanctioned as per CMA data submitted with the bank. The bank normally does not ask for any collateral. But, it, but in such case, the, the discounting facility is given bill-wise, that is, a limit is not sanctioned and it is the pure discretion of the bank whether to allow discounting of a particular bill or not. Here, it is important that the client must have good credit history as well as the relation with the bank should be good. In this case, the bank has charged on the current assets of the organization. It depends basically on requirement of the exporter, relation with the bank, track record, good repayment history and good market reputation. Let us now study the role of International Chamber of Commerce in times of turbulences. The International Chamber of Commerce ICC, was founded in 1919 to promote trade and investment worldwide. It operates in 130 countries and has 92 offices on all continents. It has three main activities, rules setting, dispute resolution under ICC arbitration rules and policy advocacy. Policy advocacy takes place in the context of 14 commissions ranging from the Banking Commission to the Anti-Corruption, Intellectual Property and Energy Commissions. The ICC Banking Commission was created 80 years ago and has become the number one forum in trade finance. It has today more than 600 institutional members in 85 countries. The Banking Commission is known for producing rules governing business in the banking sector. Some 95% of documentary credits worldwide are traded under ICC rules. Most experts agreed that business has been picking up since the last quarter of 2009. There was currently a broad return to normalcy with respect to liquidity, risk assessment and pricing of trade finance. The recovery was dri driven mainly by increased trade within North America, Europe, Asia and between Asia and the rest of the world. However, exporters, especially in emerging markets, were faced with costly credit. Indeed, differences in pricing of trade still prevail today. The ICC experts believed that low-income countries would continue to suffer in the future from the lack of access to trade finance at affordable cost, particularly import finance. It was important for ICC to keep playing a key role in bridging the information gap on trade finance. When the crisis broke up in 2007, the, the ICC was asked by the WTO Expert Group on Trade Finance to develop global surveys among its members 
that would provide an accurate picture of market trends in the absence of a comprehensive set of available statistics. Hence, the ICC Banking Commission had been able to produce three surveys in the past three years based on the replies by more than 120 banks. The surveys provided not only information on the global trends of trade finance by instruments and by regions but also on more detailed variables as the terms of settlement for international trade flows and the historical breakdown of SWIFT messaging. The service benefited from the support of ICC members and a long list of partners such as the World Bank, the International Financial Corporation IFC, the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development EBRD, the Asian Development Bank ADB, the Asian Development Bank ADB, the Inter-American Development Bank LADB SWIFT and the Bern Union the Association of Export Credit Agencies. ICC surveys have been particularly useful to policy makers in developing their understanding of the problems affecting trade finance during the recent crisis. The Basel Third Framework certainly aims at creating a stable and sustainable global financial system, but trade finance seems to have been caught in the net of re-regulation. One of the main features of re-regulation is the imposition of a leverage ratio on off-balance sheet commitments, which includes letters of credit and similar trade finance instruments. If implemented, the leverage ratio would have a detrimental impact on global trade, in particular on poor countries' trade. While the objective of the new 100% leverage ratio proposal was to develop a simple, non-risk-based measure intended to work as a backstop against excessive risk-taking for trade finance instruments which were never leveraged. This meant that banks would need to fully capitalize short-term exposures at 100% of their face value, again 20% previously. The International Chamber of Commerce, the World Business Organization, is the global leader in the development and promotion of rules for international trade finance. The ICC, in partnership with Coastline Solutions, have been delivering online training and information services in trade finance worldwide for the past 10 years. The training covers all traditional trade products, documentary collections, letters of credit, standby credits and demand guarantees. The trade finance training suite covers the full range of skill levels from beginners to advanced. The online training is written by the world's leading experts, can be taken any time and from anywhere with internet access, comes complete with LMS to manage allocation and reporting of trainee progress, is very cost effective. Each trainee receives access to the training for one year and is posted an ICC certificate on completion. These trade finance training services are used by banks, traders, law firms, logistics companies and colleges all over. The ICC intended to continue to work in order to reflect the true nature of trade finance. The ICC argued that the new proposed Basel Third Rules could have unintended consequences on this kind of finance. Some impact studies had already shown ICC members that the proposed framework, if approved drafted, would reduce trade finance lending by as much as 6% a year, that is, INR 13,500 billion in international trade. Banks would be induced to move away from trade finance because of the higher cost of capital, in particular small and ba medium-sized banks. The withdrawal of such banks from the market would disappropriately impact small and medium-sized enterprises relied on which intermediaries for financing their trade. The bigger banks might simply find trade finance less attractive compared to riskier but more remunerative products. Now moving on to the next topic, we will study the methods of payment in international trade. To succeed in today's global marketplace, exporters must offer their customers attractive sales terms supported by the appropriate payment method to win sales against foreign competitors. As getting paid in full and on time is the primary goal for each export sale, 
An appropriate payment method must be chosen carefully to minimize the payment risk while also accommodating the needs of the buyer. As shown, there are four primary methods of payment for international transactions. During or before contract negotiations, it is advisable to consider which method in the figure 3.1 is mutually desirable for customer. Key points. International trade presents a spectrum of risk causing uncertainty over the timing of payments between the exporter and importer, foreign buyer. To exporters, any sale is a gift until payment is received. Therefore, the exporter wants payment as soon as possible, preferably as soon as an order is placed or before the goods are sent to the importer. To importers, any payment is a donation until the goods are received. Letters of credit. Letters of credit are among the most secure instruments available to international traders. An LC is a commitment by a bank on behalf of the buyer that payment will be made to the exporter provided that the terms and conditions have been met as verified through the presentation of all required documents. The buyer pays its bank to render this service. An LC is useful, useful when reliable credit information about a foreign buyer is difficult to obtain but are satisfied with the credit worthiness of buyer's foreign bank. An LC also protects the buyer since no payment obligation arises until the goods have been shipped or delivered as promised. Documentary Collections A documentary collection is a transaction whereby the exporter entrusts the collection of a payment to the remitting bank, exporter's bank, which sends documents to a collecting bank, importer's bank, along with instructions for payment. Funds are received from the importer and remitted to the exporter through the banks involved in the collection in exchange for those documents. Documentary collections involve the use of a draft that requires the importer to pay the face amount either on site, document against payment, DP, or on a specified date in the future, document against acceptance, DA. The draft lists instructions that specify the documents required for the transfer of title to the goods. Open account. An open account transaction means that the goods are shipped and delivered before payment is due, usually in 30 to 90 days. Obviously, this is the most advantageous option to the importer in cash flow and cost terms, but it is consequently the highest risk option for an exporter. Due to the intense competition for export markets, foreign buyers often press exporters for open account terms since the extension of credit by the seller to the buyer is more common abroad. Therefore, exporters, exporters who are reluctant to extend credit may face the possibility of the loss of the sale to their competitors. Let's know the concept of export finance. The exporter may require short term, medium term, or long-term finance depending upon the types of goods to be exported and the terms of statement offered to overseas buyer. The short-term finance is required to meet working capital needs. The working capital is used to meet a regular and recurring needs of a business firm. The regular and recurring needs of a business firm refer to purchase of raw material, payment of wages and salaries, expenses like payment of rent, advertising, etc. The exporter may also require term finance. Types of export finance. The export finance is being classified into two types, pre-shipment finance, post-shipment finance. Pre-shipment finance. Pre-shipment is also referred as packing credit. It is working capital finance provided by commercial banks to the exporter prior to shipment of goods. The finance required to meet various expenses before shipment of goods is called pre-shipment finance or packing credit. Post-shipment finance. Post-shipment finance is provided to meet working capital requirements after the actual shipment of goods. It bridges the financial gap between the date of shipment and actual receipt of payment from overseas buyers thereof. Whereas, finance provided after shipment of goods is called post-shipment finance. Exporting tends to be more demanding. 
financially than selling in the UK. Consignments are usually larger, lead times are longer and the risks are more difficult to control. Negotiating the terms of an export sale is a matter of balancing the risks and the cost and customer. At the same time, we need to take into account the problems of handling payment in foreign currencies. This briefing focuses on negotiating the payment method, choosing the right financing option, dealing with foreign currencies. First steps, the terms of an export sale must satisfy customer. We need to agree the terms of delivery covering the dis division of responsibility for transport costs and for the risk of loss or damage in transit. Standard international terms are set in INCO Terms 2000. Ask potential customers what terms they prefer and what causes them problems. Payment Methods the payment method used has a significant effect on the financing required and the level of risk to which are exposed. Open account payment is similar to offering credit to a UK customer. Typically, the credit term, example 30 days, starts once dispatch and invoice for the goods in line with the terms of trade. Bear all the risks of offering credit, such as for a sale in the UK. Need to arrange finance to fund the whole of the transaction. There are no extra costs other than those involved in any export transaction. Open account payment is typically used for exports within the EU and export sales to whom customers with whom we have an established relationship. The payment method. The customer's credit worthiness will determine what methods are prepared to accept. The currency will be paid. The documentation. Financing options. Unless we have negotiated payment in advance, exporting may require additional financing. While we may be able to use a standard loan or overdraft facility, other options can be more cost effective and provide access to greater amounts of working capital. We can arrange a foreign currency loan or overdraft to borrow the amount of foreign currency expect to be paid. We may be able to use a proof of the export sale as security for the borrowing. Bank may only accept this form of security if it has approved the customer or purchase credit insurance. Exchange the money borrowers into pounds sterling to use as working capital. Repay the borrowing with the payment received from customer. Foreign currencies. Most customers will prefer to quote and invoice them in their local currencies rather than pounds sterling. Unless we are prepared to do so, they may choose alternative suppliers. However, invoicing in a foreign currency exposes to additional risks and costs. We have a foreign exchange risk for any amounts hold or expect to receive in a foreign currency. We are at particular risk if the foreign currency is volatile or chronically weak, for example, in some Middle Eastern or African currencies. Some currencies present extra difficulties. We will need a foreign currency bank account to hold the funds until convert them to sterling. This quick guide explains what an overseas in investment insurance policy is, how it works, its benefits, its key features and how to apply for the policy from UK Export Finance. An overseas investment insurance policy covers the risk of loss resulting from certain political events in connection with an investment made by an investor in the United Kingdom in an enterprise outside the United Kingdom. The policy can also cover losses arising in connection with a guarantee given by the insured in respect of an investment made by another person in an enterprise outside the United Kingdom in which the insured has an interest. The benefits are any investment of resources may be considered for cover including loans or subscriptions for shares, indirect investments and guarantees given to other investors may also be covered. Up to 90% of losses can be covered resulting from the specified events. The policy may be renewed annually on the same terms and premium rate and run for up to 15 years. Risks covered. Full details of the risks covered are set outline 
the policy but they include war, civil war, revolution and insurrection in the host state, expropriation or nationalization of the enterprise in which the investment is made or of its property contrary to international law and restrictions on remittances including exchange controls imposed by the host state. Banks are also allowed to rediscount export bills abroad at rates linked to international interest rates at post-shipment stage. Scheme It will be comparatively easier to have a facility against bills portfolio covering all eligible bills than to have rediscounting facility abroad on bill-by-bill -bill basis. There will, however, be no bar if rediscounting facility on bill-to-bill -bill basis is arranged by a bank in case of any particular exporter, especially for large value transactions. Banks may arrange a Banker's Acceptance Facility BAF, for rediscounting the export bills without any margin and duly covered by collateralized documents. Eligibility Criteria the scheme will cover mainly export bills with usance period up to 180 days from the date of shipment inclusive of normal transit period and grace period, if any. There is, however, no bar to include demand bills if overseas institution has no objection to it. The facility under the scheme of rediscounting may be offered if any convertible currency. Source of onshore funds there will be no bar on banks to utilize the foreign exchange resources available with them in exchange earners. Exchange earners foreign currency accounts Resident foreign currency accounts RFC Foreign currency non-resident accounts Banks scheme to discount usance bills and retain them in their portfolio without resorting to rediscounting. In case of demand bills, subject to what has been stated, these may have to be routed through the existing post-shipment credit facility or by way of foreign exchange loans to the exporters out of the foreign currency balances available with the banks in the schemes a bid. To facilitate the growth of local market for rediscounting export bills, establishment and development of an active interbank market is desirable. It is possible that banks hold bills in their own portfolio without rediscounting. However, in case of need, the banks should also have access to the local market, which will enable the country to save foreign exchange to the extent of the cost of rediscounting. Further, as different banks may be having BAF for varying amounts, it will be possible for a bank which has balance available in its limit to offer rediscounting facility to another bank which may have exhausted its limit or could not arrange for such a facility. Facility of rediscounting with recourse and without recourse. It is recognized that it will be difficult to get without recourse facility from abroad under BAF or any other facility. Therefore, the bills may be rediscounted with recourse. However, if an AD is in a position to arrange without recourse facility on competitive terms, it is permitted to avail itself of such a facility. Now in the end, let us summarize what we have learnt in this lecture. The bank will not discount the bills and just send the same for collection to importer bank. As and when the collection is done, amount is credited in exporter account. The ICC Banking Commission was created 80 years ago and has become the number one forum in trade finance. As getting paid in full and on time is the primary goal for each export sale, an appropriate payment method must be chosen carefully to minimize the payment risk while also accommodating the needs of the buyer. The regular and recurring needs of a business firm refer to purchase of raw material, payment of wages and salaries, expenses like payment of rent, advertising, etc. Direct discounting of export bills by exporters with overseas bank or any other agency will be done only through the branch of a bank designated by him for this purpose. 
The policy can also cover losses arising in connection with a guarantee given by the insured in respect of an investment made by another person in an enterprise outside the United Kingdom in which the insured has an interest.